probably all know that our day-to-day -day number system is base 10, and you probably know that computers work off of a base 2 number system, and perhaps you've heard that a base 12 number system is really nice, but what about a base factorial number system? So what do I even mean by that? Well, let's look at the definition. So let's take this expression right here, a n colon a n minus one, all the way down a two colon a one subfactorial. So that will be a number expressed in this base factorial. So we're gonna set that equal to a n times n factorial plus a n minus one times n minus one factorial all the way down a two times two factorial and then a one times one factorial. And there's an important caveat here, and that is that we have a sub k is always between zero and k. So each place value here can take a different range. So just for some examples, let's notice that one zero, or the 10 in this number system, is one times two factorial plus zero times one factorial. In other words, it's the number two. Furthermore, this 310 is 3 times 3 factorial plus 1 times 2 factorial plus 0 times 1 factorial. In other words, it is 20. So I think this is pretty interesting, and it leads us uh, initially to the following question, and that is, can we express every number in this base factorial system? And if we can, is that expression unique? And in fact, the answer to both of those questions is yes, and is highlighted by this claim that we'll prove. And so we'll prove that every positive integer can be uniquely expressed in this base factorial number system. Okay, so we're gonna start with our existence proof, and we're gonna do that by induction. So notice that we've done some base cases over here. You can do some more if you want to. So what we'll start with is an induction hypothesis. It'll be a strong induction hypothesis. So let's suppose for all numbers k between one and some number m, the number k can be written in base factorial. And we're also gonna assume that our number m is not a factorial itself. That just kind of makes everything nice. Okay, so now how will we proceed from this? Okay, so now what we wanna do is find the two factorials that m is between. So in other words, we'll find some natural number n such that we know that n factorial is strictly less than m, which is strictly less than n plus one factorial. And that's why we assumed up here that m was not a factorial so that it would be strictly between two consecutive factorial numbers. Now, after finding it being between these two consecutive uh, factorial numbers, let's now find a number a and that number a is going to be between 1 and n so that we know that a times n factorial is less than m, which is in turn less than or equal to, or let's see, less than a plus 1 times n factorial. So we can further, you know, whittle it down like that. I think that's kind of something that's pretty clearly possible, especially if we change that inequality to a less than or equal to. But now let's observe from each part of that inequality, we can subtract a times n factorial, and we'll be left with zero is less than or equal to m minus a times n factorial, which is less than a plus one minus a times n factorial. But notice that a plus one minus a is simply one, so that means that this thing is less than n factorial. Okay. So now what we'll do is apply the induction hypothesis to this number m minus a times n factorial. That's why we needed a strong induction hypothesis, because likely that's not equal to m minus 1. So that means that we can write that number, this m minus a times n factorial, as 
a n minus one times n minus one factorial plus all the way down to a one times one factorial. In other words, it's this a n minus one colon all the way down a one sub factorial. And let's maybe highlight the fact that we knew that this had to stop, if you will, at n minus one factorial because we know that our number is strictly less than n factorial. So it can't have any n factorial part in its expansion. But now let's observe that if we add a times n factorial to both sides, we'll be left with m is equal to a colon a n minus one colon a n minus two, all the way down, we have a two colon a one sub factorial. In other words, we have expressed m in this factorial based number system. But this is exactly what we needed to do for this induction proof that yes, we can express every positive integer in this base factorial number system. Okay, so now that we know that it, there is an existence of this type of expression, let's prove that the expression is unique. Thanks for sticking around this long into the video. If you're enjoying the video, make sure and give it a thumbs up. And if you're not yet subscribed, consider subscribing, it really helps out. Okay, we've just shown that there exists a factorial representation for every positive integer. Now we're gonna show that that representation is unique and we'll do that by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that we have a natural number where it has a non-unique expansion, a base factorial, if you will. So that means that we have this AM factorial, AM minus one, all the way down to A2, A1 sub factorial is equal to uh, BN colon all the way down to B1 factorial. And that's going to be where potentially the A's and the B's are, the not, are not the same set of numbers. Okay, so now I'm going to start off by observing that we might as well assume that M is less than or equal to N. That's just by the fact that, well, one of them has to be less than or equal to the other. That's just how these natural numbers work. Okay, now let's write those out in terms of their definition. So let's notice that we'll have bn times n factorial plus all the way down to bm times m factorial plus all the way down to b1 times one factorial. So I'll just leave that as b1. But now this is gonna be equal to am times m factorial plus all the way down to a1. So I've done that because this bit that I'm underlining in blue has the same ending point, if you will, m factorial as the entire right-hand side. But now I'd like to observe the following, and that is that we know that this left-hand side is gonna be bigger than or equal to n factorial. And I guess that's because we're assuming that this bn is bigger than or equal to one. I didn't say that, but we might as well not have trailing zeros over there on the left. So needless to say, we might as well take this left-hand side to be less than or equal to, or sorry, bigger than or equal to this n factorial. But then this right-hand side is going to be less than or equal to m times m factorial plus m minus one times m minus one factorial all the way down to one times one factorial. And so we get that inequality simply by replacing each of those a's with their largest possible value given this rule over here. But now I'm gonna use a kind of a well-known fact and you can prove this by induction if you will and that is that this expression over here, this sum of m times m factorial all the way down is equal to m plus one factorial minus one, which is of course gonna be strictly less than m plus one factorial. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. We've got this n factorial is strictly less than m plus one factorial, 
but that tells us that n is strictly less than m plus 1. In other words, we know that n is less than or equal to m. But now let's look at our kind of assumption that we made up here, which was m is less than or equal to n. So if we put those two together, our assumption, and then this thing that we've just proven, we see that m must be equal to n. So that means if we have two expressions of a number base factorial, that they at least have to have the same number of digits. So now what I'd like to do is show that not only do they have the same number of digits, but they actually have to have all of the same digit. Before we finish this uniqueness proof off, I'd like to tell you about my second channel, Math Major, where I have full courses in mostly upper division math classes. And in fact, that entire channel is kept ad-free thanks to my support on Patreon and via channel memberships. If you'd like to help support me keeping that ad-free, maybe think about becoming a channel member or becoming a patron, but there's no pressure. Okay, so now let's get back into it. So we proved that if we had two expressions for a natural number, base factorial, if you will, then they had to have the same number of so-called digits. And so that's what we have here. We have a n, a n minus one, all the way down a two one has to be equal to b n, b n minus one, all the way down b two, b one. And those are both subfactorial, keeping in mind our definition over here of that factorial expansion. So now we're gonna break this into two cases. So the first case is that a j is equal to b j for all one less than or equal to j less than or equal to n. In other words, all of the digits are the same. But that's exactly what we wanna show. So if that's the case, then we are done. Then the second case is they're not all the same. In other words, there exists an i that is between one and n where a i is not equal to b i. And so now let's see what happens with that case. Okay, so if there exists such an i, we can pick the largest. So take the largest k between one and n with a k not equal to b k. And now I'm just gonna assume like we did in the start of this portion of the proof that a k is bigger than b k. So if they're not equal, then one of them has to be larger. We'll take a k to be the larger one. But now let's observe what we have now. We have a k times k factorial plus all the way down to a1 is gonna be equal to b k times k factorial all the way down to b1. And that's from subtracting off all of the higher digits. And so of course, this equation right here would have an a k plus one, a b k plus one, and all the way up to an an and a bn, but we could subtract all of those off because they're exactly the same given the fact that k is the largest point where we have um, unequality in the digits. Okay, so now I'm going to subtract a bk times k factorial over here to the left-hand side. So that's gonna give me the following expression we'll have a k minus b k times k factorial plus a k minus one times k minus one factorial all the way down to a one is gotta be equal to b k minus one times k minus one factorial all the way down to b one. Okay, good. But now let's observe that this a k minus b k is gonna be bigger than or equal to one. And that's because we have that these are not equal, which means their difference is strictly bigger than zero, which means their difference is bigger than or equal to one because they're both positive integers. So that means that this thing right here has gotta be bigger than or equal to k factorial. Again, because we've got a number that's bigger than or equal to one times k factorial. But now let's go over here and observe that this is gonna be less than or equal to k minus one times k minus one factorial. 
add it all the way down to one times one factorial. And that's again by a similar thing to what we did before, replacing all of those b's with their largest possible value. But of course, we know that this is going to be equal to k factorial minus 1 by that identity that we used before. That, If you'd like to, you can prove that for yourself by induction. Okay, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this inequality that we have just derived and put it in the box over there just to cut out the middle. And let's observe that we have just found that k factorial is less than or equal to k factorial minus 1, or I guess if you want to subtract k factorial from both sides, we have just determined that 0 is less than or equal to negative 1, which is a clear contradiction. Contradicting this ability to have any different digits at all, meaning case 1 is the only possible case, meaning we have a uniqueness in our expression of numbers in this base factorial number system. And that's a good place to stop.